Good creative fam. Super hyped about this week's live stream. As you guys can see in the background, Jarrell is back. And Some of guys. course, Jarrell has his own camera. He's there. <laughs> 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 he's going to be monitoring the chat this week uh as you guys saw with this upgrade this minor upgrade we did this week with the countdown let me know what you guys think about that countdown it gives us a few minutes to make sure that we're actually live everywhere uh also it allows us to kind of check some things out make sure that like audio is working uh because we are live streaming to two different platforms right now we're live streaming not only on here on youtube but we're also live streaming directly to the creative fam academy app and so really really excited about that uh as you guys can see right now we are currently popping up where you guys are tuning in from we got people from the uk in here people from new york in here fort worth which is just right up the road from where i'm at um but yeah, we're really, really excited. We got South Florida in the house. Who else we got, Jarrell? Let me get one more. Let me get one oh, more. Oh, 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 sweet. Did I see Sweden? Did we say Sweden? I think I saw Sweden in the Sweden chat as in, well. Yeah. Sweden is in the chat. So uh, Life of the Man. That is a, that's a dope name. Um, but yeah, man, just thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, you know, every single time that I do these live streams, the goal is to try to make them better and better with each one. And so far, I can already just just by looking at the chat and how like engaged everyone is, um, it's just going really, really well. So uh, one thing I do want to mention, this live stream, as you guys saw in the title and the thumbnail, is all about profitable filmmaking. And so this is a live business strategy live stream for videographers. So if you are someone who is interested in growing your video production business, whether that's questions about gear or whether that's questions about business, um, it's so important to us that you actually put those questions in the chat. Like I said, Jarrell is here and he's going to be monitoring that chat. Jarrell, go ahead and pop up that overlay for me. This is something I made like five seconds before the live stream. Uh, but yeah, as you guys can see right there, you can put your questions in the chat about video production because that's what we're going to be covering in this uh, on this live stream. Um, I actually did something not too long ago um, that kind of took me back a little bit. So for some of you who are here, like Mr. Camera Junkie, um, he will remember that like back in two, what was it, 2021? I used to do live streams every single week. And on those live streams, I would answer questions live on YouTube, live on the stream. And I would even invite you guys up to actually be on the stream. And that is something that we are currently working our way back to. And so we are so excited about bringing live streams back. The goal right now is to actually bring back these live streams on a very, very regular basis because I understand that like, you know, YouTube is a great resource and the Creative Fam Academy is a great resource, but like being able to ask your very specific questions and get those answered, it can provide you that value that you need that literally transforms your business to the next level. And so the goal here is going to be going live on a very, very regular basis to answer the questions that you guys have. But we're also going to go live to just talk about crazy stuff that's going on, like whether that's stuff that's going on in the news, whether that's new camera gear, what's going on on social uh of course of course we always got to talk about movies because i do love movies uh it's the whole reason why i got started in this journey but ultimately we're going to be spending a lot of time going live to be able to provide you guys with as much value as we possibly can and so if this is your first time tuning in for a live stream you're in for a treat we're going to have a great time of course of course because we're doing this in december we have to talk about the 25 days of Christmas. Now, for those of you guys who don't know about the 25 days of Christmas, this is a ongoing giveaway that we have been doing for the entire month of December. Every single day, we have been giving away another piece of gear. And I'm looking over at the calendar right now because I'm looking at what today's item is because we actually haven't made the post about it yet. But today we're actually giving away a backpack. And so this is going to be a awesome camera bag. Be sure to check out my Instagram after the live stream. We'll be posting that up. Uh, but yeah, we're just really excited to be giving away stuff. I know there's some people in the chat who've actually won stuff this month. So if you've won something this month, definitely chime off in the chat because we're really, really excited about the 25 days of Christmas. Ultimately, it's just our way of giving back. You know, like at the end of the day, we built 
all of these resources to be able to provide value. And that's what I've been doing, or at least trying to do here on YouTube for the five, six years that I've been creating content on YouTube. But I always keep kind of coming back to live streams because I feel like live streams is where we can all truly, truly engage with one another. So um, I want to take a second. Let's go through the chat. There's Mr. Camera Junkie. He says he was a winner. Uh, and I think, I think he won a light. Is that right? I believe he won a light. Um, but yeah, just really, really excited about all the awesome stuff. So let's go ahead. Let's pop up some chats for us, Jarrell. Let's just kind of engage for a little bit and then we'll start hopping into some questions because I know there's going to be a lot of questions about running a video production company. Oh, absolutely. So oh, this is a really good, uh, so you said you you don't want questions yet you just want to show some people off yeah let's just let's let's just make sure we have everybody showing up but are, are the questions rolling in because if they're rolling oh yeah in... yeah yeah they're in we have tons of questions <laughs> <laughs> okay all right well if it's easier we can go ahead and hop into these questions because i know you guys came here to to learn about business and then i have some other stuff that i definitely want to talk to you guys about because i think business is one of those areas where we can absolutely all improve and especially as we get ready to go into 2024 um i want everyone to have the best year they've ever had you know i will say that you know selfishly this last year had its ups and downs you know like for just a moment like i think there were times i think for everyone whether that was with the strike or because of the economy it definitely had its ups and downs and so there was a lot of business tweaks that i personally even had to make this year in order to make sure that you know cash flow stayed well people still kept getting paid payroll was being taken care of so i know that business can be a struggle but Jarrell, if you got a question, if you're ready for the first one, I'll go ahead and cut to you. We'll pull up their question on stream and then we'll go ahead and start answering. Yeah, definitely. So, Tours, sorry if I said your name wrong. Uh, <laughs> how do you start a videography business from scratch? I think it's a great basic question to start off with and just kind of let it let them know. Yeah, you know, starting anything from scratch is always going to be super challenging. And probably my piece of advice is not the one that most people would give. So for me, when it comes to starting a video business from scratch, if you haven't done anything, the first thing I think you got to figure out is, is this something you really want to do? You know, the truth is, is that like, yeah, you could go and get your business started and do get your LLC or get your DBA. Uh, you could go ahead and get your tax stuff taken care of. You could start, you know, looking for clients and all that. But if you're literally just starting from scratch, I would strongly recommend to just go out and just start shooting some projects for fun. And when I say shoot for fun, this could mean shooting for a business for free, but it needs to be a business that you really are interested in shooting for and that you want to create content around because you need to make sure that there is joy in the creation process before you try to turn this thing into a business. The truth is, is that like there are going to be days where like you're not going to feel like working, but you're going to have to get that edit done. You're going to have to go out and do that shoot. And so I always say that you need to make sure that you find the joy in what you do first before you try to turn it into a full-fledged business. From there, the next big thing is just going to be figuring out which avenue you want to go up. You know, you can shoot weddings. You can shoot quinceaneras. You can shoot real estate. You can shoot commercials. You can shoot films and documentaries. So there's just so many different avenues you can go as a videographer that I think part of that journey, especially at the beginning of like figuring out where you want to get started and if how do you find that joy, is figuring out which area you really want to film in. From there, once you have that dialed in, the next biggest thing is obviously figuring out where you want to charge and what you want to make. Everybody's journey here is going to be different, but I will say the second that you put monetary attachment to your art, it does slightly change it a little bit. And so this is one of those areas where, especially if you're at the beginning, I always recommend try shooting a little bit of everything. Maybe try shooting a wedding and see if you like it. Shoot a concert, shoot a corporate gig, look for these clients in these different industries so that once you figure out what you like to do, see if charging money for it changes it. Like I know for me, like I actually like shooting weddings oddly, 
uh, for people I know, but I hate shooting weddings for people I don't know. And that's because when the money starts getting exchanged, the, the joy of the shooting and the experience is gone for me. And so like, I'm one of those people who won't shoot weddings for strangers, but if a friend hits me up and they need help shooting a wedding, or if a friend hits me up and they're getting married and they ask me if I can shoot it for them, then I'm like, yeah, I enjoy it because I actually enjoy the wedding. It's a party. It's a good time. But once money starts getting exchanged and that becomes my main source of income, for me, weddings kind of go out the picture. So it's really important for you to not only find what you like to shoot that's going to bring you joy, but also figure out what you feel comfortable charging for and still maintaining that joy so you can have a long journey in this uh, videography career that you have. So I think that would probably be, if you're starting from scratch, those are like the first bits of advice I'd give. Yeah, I think a part of that that I think that is going to be super helpful that I heard from that is start off really practical. Start off shooting on your phone. Start off with a free editor like CapCut or what's another free one, Brandon? Da Vinci, bro. Da Vin oh, Da, da Vinci. Vinci. Well, I know da Vinci it's so is, good that people that's forget that it's free, but that's, it's free. I would definitely start with Da Vinci. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a hard one. That, and don't get me wrong, like it's incredible. But yeah, so anyways, start shooting on your phone. Start on a free editor, and like say, go out shoot some stuff. Make sure you love it because some people love shooting, some people love editing. I feel like it's pretty rare that you love to do both and you find joy in both. But as you do some projects and as you figure it out, then you'll literally know this is something I want to go down. Because if you talk to anybody that does this freelancing or full time, bro, you get to a point where you'll want to make sure before you invest 20, 30, $40,000 that this is exactly what you want to do, whether that's education, whether it's gear, or it's all that sort of stuff. So no, that's great. Uh, this one goes on the, oh, yep. Hold yep. on. Before before we go to that next question, yeah, I, I have to pop up one. So I'm going to pop up one here. So TSA Dre Day. So this is my son. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have no idea why he's on this live stream. Uh, primarily because he should be in school. So I'm pausing the live stream for one second to say, Andre, you should be in school right now focusing. I have no idea why you're on the live stream. However, that said, if you guys see the TSA Dre Day in the chat on YouTube, um, he actually does have a little YouTube channel. He crossed 100 subscribers, and I'm very proud of him. I've never publicly announced his channel because I wanted him to grow on its own. But, uh, oh, he says he's at lunch, and they let them use their phones. <laughs> that's what he says. That's his, that's, his, that's, his, that's his thought. So I will say, if you, guys, uh, if you guys could, go show him some love. But, yeah, my kid is in the chat. This is a weird uh, fatherly moment for me. I will say that. <laughs> Did not expect this to happen. But, uh, yeah, my son's at lunch. Andre, have a great day at school. I love you, bud. Um, and hopefully he'll be on a live stream here next week when we he doesn't have school. But uh, love you, kiddo. And thank you so much for tuning in, Andre. <laughs> All right. I know you had a real question, so we'll get back to the real questions. But family first. Family first over here. I see my kid. I got to acknowledge it. <laughs> That's cool. So yeah, uh, we're going to go the opposite spectrum. Obviously, that's the very beginning. This one's going to be uh, a little bit more uh, hairy. So uh, could you do a brief advice about business taxes as the year is closing? Yes, dude. Okay, first of all, you're not going to like my answer. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Um, because it may, maybe you will, but here's my thought. One, preference. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a tax lawyer. I'm not an accountant. <laughs> All of the prerequisites before I answer this question. Uh, but my my first one is, if you can, get one. Find a CPA. Find a tax lawyer. Get someone who can actually help you with your taxes. Because the one thing I've learned about taxes uh, in my oh, 10 plus years of having to manage them is that it feels like every year the rules change. Like every year there are new tax laws, new tax breaks, what you can write off, what you can't write off, how you can write off a vehicle, how you can't write off a vehicle, mileage, all these different things change every single year. And so my first bit, bit of advice, I think it would be, I think it'd be wrong for me not to at least recommend to speak with a professional. Even if you can't afford to have a professional do your taxes every year, maybe just at least try to sit down with a tax professional and talk to them. Now, that said, Let's actually go into some advice that I'd give you. The first is now, right now, especially in December, 
it is so important that you go through your year of spending as well as your year of income. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get to tax season, which is in April, I believe. And you're going to have to look back at this year, but not be able to make any additional changes. And here's what I mean. As a business, you have some leverage that you can do. You can spend a little bit more. You can you know, cut back on spending as the year ends. You can write off some things. You can look at some of the end of the year expenditures and start making some adjustments. For example, there's actually something that you can do, and this is something that my tax person helped me set up, where you can actually put money away for retirement and that will actually count as a write-off. So if you find yourself like, you know, right at the bottom tier of the next tax bracket and you're trying to bring yourself down a little bit, you can do some write-offs that will actually benefit you in the long run by actually putting money away towards uh, retirement. And if you happen to have employees, you, you're going to have to match it, but you can even have money go towards your employees as far as going as a, uh, as a, going towards their, um, going towards their, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Their retirement that, as well. Yeah. So there's there's little tricks like that that if you talk to a CPA, a financial advisor, that they can actually walk you through. So that way it's not like, oh, hey, I'm at this tax bracket. I need to get rid of some money. Let me go buy a piece of gear that's going to depreciate that I don't really need so I can just write it off. But what you can do is actually put that money into a place that's actually going to benefit you in the long run. And that's personally what I recommend doing. And that's what I do. Now, that said, talk to a CPA, talk to a financial advisor and work out that plan. But for anybody that's in here right now, if you're making money, I would strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you talk to a CPA and that you start getting your finances in order now. Because the truth is, is that in a couple of days, the year is going to be over and you're not going to be able to make any adjustments to how your finances rolled out this year. So that's just my last piece of it. Oh, actually, I have one more. If you're self-employed, and this is if you're planning on buying a house or a car or something like that next year, really make sure you tell that to your CPA because there are certain things where like, I'll be honest, there was a couple of years ago where I didn't write off as much because we were trying to get into a house. And I made sure that it showed that I made a lot more, which meant, yes, I did have to technically pay more in taxes. But as a business, I was able to kind of make those decisions because when you're self-employed and you're trying to, you know, get financing for stuff, it can be more difficult because all they're going to do is look at your year to year tax returns. And so what you set as your tax limit or your tax returns now is ultimately what you're going to actually have to like live by next year if you plan on like trying to buy a house or a car or something where you're going to need a large amount of financing. So. That's yeah, my, that's my solution. Yeah, Brandon, I don't know. I mean, obviously, yours is probably a little bit different, but like just for some context, like my CPA, we pay them $300 and I can pretty much contact them throughout the year with like brief, light questions and just be like, hey, this is where my quarterly income is at. You know, can you give me some guidance? And they will give me an exact number of like, you probably will want to have ten thousand dollars in expenses like go buy something you know so you don't go into that 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 upper tax whatever deal and so uh that would be my suggestion to you like when you say get a cpa obviously there's probably certain levels and costs and all that sort of stuff that can get crazy but like for me like 300 bucks is well worth it the to save the headache are you paying 300 a month or 300 a year 300 dollars a year that's a really cheap uh, CPA. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, three hundred dollars. No, uh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I don't know if my person's just super nice. They <laughs> love me or what, but yeah, three hundred bucks. So I'm sure there's there's people that that need a lot more services. They only do my taxes. They don't do like like anything else. Okay, that taxes. makes sense. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. mine does a little bit of financial advising as well as gotcha. also setting up. Uh, like I don't even know what it's called. But there's something that we have set up where I can literally put money away towards uh, my my retirement as well as it puts money away for the kids and stuff like that. No. And it's because we technically have my kids listed as employees. It's weird. I don't know how it works. No, no, that's good. Yeah, just so just so you know that there is a spectrum. I'm sure you could pay a lawyer, CPA, you could do the most, but it is affordable enough, especially if you're making money in your business. All right, cool. Next question. Um, this one's good. 
uh, how should we approach small businesses to provide video services? I feel like client acquisition is the hardest thing for a lot of, you know, videography business. So Brandon, how would you, how would you handle this? Yeah. So the, and that mean, I talk about this. I feel like I've said this so many times. So I feel like a, a, you've heard me say this before. I'm sorry, but like the thing about small businesses and honestly businesses of any size is that like businesses actually don't really buy videos. Like there's like this, the stigma as videographers that like uh, a, a company wants a video. So they hire a videographer. But the truth is, is that they actually don't want a video. What they want is a solution to some problem. And they believe that solution can be solved with a video. So case in point, you have Starbucks, right? Because I just happen to have a cup here. And they need everybody to know about their new holiday drinks. So the problem is they have new holiday drinks, but nobody knows about it. So how do they get people to know about it? They need a video. And that's where videographers sort of make the mistake is they think the company is buying their video, but really what they're buying a solution is what they're buying is a solution to the problem. So here's how you go about solving that, especially for small businesses, is you don't talk about your video as much. What you need to do is talk about the solution to the problem that they have. And this is where your discovery call that you have with your client is incredibly important. Every single call I hop on with a client, I want to know three things. I want to know one, what is like, what is the purpose of making this video? Like, why, why are we making a video? Like, are you trying to educate people about a resource? Are you trying to market a widget? Are you trying to possibly just make internal training content for your employees so that way you don't have to waste as much time doing like onboarding? Like, there's a lot of solutions to why video can be helpful, but you need to know what the so like what is the purpose of the video. The next thing I want to know is like creatively, what is like what are they hoping to get from the video? Like, what do they want it to look like? And then the third one is the budget. You got to know the budget on the first call. So those are the three things. And here it becomes the easiest part is when you ask those questions specifically in that order on your call, when you ask them what's the purpose of the video, they will tell you their problem. So then when it comes to the other two, you start solving the problem with what they answer, what they with what they asked you. So if they say, "Hey, we need people to know about our new seasonal drinks." Well, Okay, well, you ask them, okay, well, what's the purpose? We want people to know about it. Who are the people? Oh, it's millennials or it's Gen Z. Great. So now when they start talking about what they want the video to actually look like, you in your mind as the, as the creator and as the professional can start helping them to craft a video that will also go towards solving that problem. Then when they bring up the budget, you can walk them through creating a budget that also helps them solve the problem. So now throughout your entire pitch for them, you are not talking about resolution or lighting or audio or any of those things. Throughout your entire pitch, all you're doing is talking about how what you do is gonna solve their problem. Now you're different than every other videographer out there because I guarantee you everybody else is like, oh, well, I'm gonna shoot this thing on a red or I'm gonna shoot it with these lights or I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z to make sure your video looks great. And as far as I'm concerned, if you call yourself a videographer and a professional, your stuff should look good no matter what. And they can see that from your past work. So now what you need to do when you're talking to these small businesses is talk about how you're gonna solve their problems. And trust me, it works. Yeah, definitely. It's so crazy too. I find that if you go the solution route of their problem, you will oftentimes end up on a way bigger budget. And it's not, it's not meant to like gouge people or to, uh, to extract the most amount of money out of them. But like the moment that they get their mind off of, I just need like a little video, a little promo, a little this, a little ad, all of a sudden now you become so much more valuable to them with helping them work through their problems. You gave us a lot of great insight and wisdom, and this is a great time just to kind of show people a little bit more about what we do. If you felt like that was kind of like, if you liked that and you're like, man, I want to dig more into that and I want to know more about that, it's a great time to talk about the CFA. And so I am going to take off that comment because it's stuck up there. Oh, perfect, it. you got it. Uh, 
in the CFA, uh, in the Creative Fam Academy, we have courses, guides that literally will help you walk through so many different things on the business side of things. Most of you guys know how to turn on a camera, put up a light, mic someone with audio. But what you might struggle with is you might struggle with client acquisition. You might struggle with how much do I charge? You may struggle with like, help me walk through that problem solution sort of deal when you're talking with clients. And the business guide for creative professionals is an incredible resource. Uh, Brandon, is there anything that I left out about the business guide? I mean, the other thing that we actually talk about in this business the last couple of years, which is also teaching like how you actually build a team and how you go about the process of like streamlining your business, because it's easy. And I, I can tell you, like once you figure out these little tricks that we teach throughout the guide, it's really easy to do it once. But what gets difficult is when you have, you know, you're in the middle of a very big project. Maybe it's your first, you know, five thousand, ten thousand dollar project. And you're in the middle of that project and another client calls you. And so now you're like, okay, I'm, I got one client and I'm juggling the second client and I need to onboard them. So by the time this first job is done, I'm ready to move into the second one. But then a third client calls you because what you're going to find is that when you start like lining up your business correctly, the jobs just start flowing in. And so how do you build a system that can manage multiple people joining in? Well, that's exactly what we teach in the business guide for creative professionals is not only how you actually go about client acquisition, handling money, you know, handling like the business itself, but then ultimately how you systematize it and you onboard a team because you will get to a place to where you can't do it by yourself. And so it's super important, I think, to at least have the resources to know, okay, how do I work with the team, freelancers versus employees? How do I find these people? These are the kind of things that we go over in the Business Guide for Creative Professionals. Well, that's awesome. Hey, this stream is all about profitable filmmaking, live business strategies for videographers. Brandon, I've got a personal deal that we kind of talked about this just a little bit beforehand about an issue of it is so easy to get into videography and not be profitable. And if you're not, if you're not improving on that continually, you will find yourself doing jobs, making money, money coming in. Um, but you're not even really sure if you're profitable, if you're adding anything, because you might be buying gear, you might be renting stuff, you might be charging too little. And so I'm going to tell you something that happened to me this week. And I kind of want you like, I, I, I know what I did wrong. But maybe through my situation, you can also help coach the people that are maybe on the live stream if you've ever been in this situation. So here's kind of the what happened. I had a person reach out to me and said, hey, I heard you take great photos and video. I want to set up a little shoot of a sports team. Okay, And so uh, they said 10 photos. And so to me, when they said 10 photos, it was a very strong indication that like, oh, we're not doing a full out production. I'm just coming in. It's local, going to snap about 10 poses, you know, of this sports team. And that's going to be it. So I'm like literally like trying to process that through my head. They're like, yeah, we might have about 30 minutes. So I feel like when clients say this, once again, they're they're letting me know that like this is not a big thing, you know, sort of deal. And so I quote them 500 bucks. I say, yeah, it's local. I can come out, set up a light, snap a photo, snap 10 photos, deliver it to you. They even say, hey, and if you want, you can even sell these back to their to their parents. And I'm like thinking at first, you know, this is pretty nice. This is good. But then it was like, hey, can we uh, do like a little like behind the scene? We saw one of these videos that you did behind the scenes uh, of the shoot. So we could use it as promo. And I'm like, yeah. And then they send me examples of like what they want. And I'm like, oh, so this isn't a little production anymore. But now I kind of feel trapped. I don't feel like I can like go back and be like, hey, I'm charging you $1,500. I'm charging you $2,000 because initially this was a little shoot. So Brandon, what, uh, how would you, uh, how would, how do you not end up in those situations where all of a sudden you go from, you know, being like, oh, that's that's decent. That's a decent half an hour, 500 bucks to all of a sudden it blows up into this much larger project. All right. This is probably one of my favorite quotes or my favorite lines to say. Um, 
because it's the, it's the professional way of saying ain't gonna happen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is the professional way of saying ain't gonna happen. Um, let's let's call her let's call her Terry. Um, hey Terry, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> um, however, at our current rate, that's just a little out of scope, and that's literally what I say out of scope. And that that phrase goes a long way because it doesn't say that it's impossible to do. And it's not saying no, it's saying it is currently at our current rate out of scope. However, if you'd like to add that in, I can absolutely write you up a quote and send you over what that would look like to add it in. And what it does is now, instead of it being your decision on if you're going to add this extra thing for them for free or not, but what it becomes is their decision of like, how valuable is this addition to them? And I have used that phrase so many times because, and this is like, I mean, I read this book as a child and it's so true. If you give a mouse a cookie, eventually he takes the whole house. Like spoiler alert, that's how the video ends or how the, how the book ends. So it's super, super important that you are firm in what you offer and that you have it in writing. So this is one of the reasons why I do recommend, you know, have a contract. Um, I recommend if at, at best, at least have a text thread, something, something that's in writing, like not just a phone call. Emails are great. But like if you can figure out a way to make sure that like you are letting the client know that, hey, this is currently out of scope. And as much as like it sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. But let me send you over a quote to add that in. And then we can actually absolutely do it. So that phrase out of scope has saved me so many times and it makes uncomfortable conversations much, much easier to manage. So that's what I would say. Now, I know it's always difficult when you when you actually have that client, because then the fear becomes, well, what if what if they don't want to do the original job? Like, what if they back out altogether? And this is one of those reasons why, like with the Business Guide for Creative Professionals, we talk about building out a system. Part of that system is like, you know, getting a deposit, making sure that they're locked in. So even, even if it is a $500 job, get $250 in the deposit. Get a $100 deposit down, a $50 deposit down, something that just makes sure that they are really, really locked in. Because I will tell you guys, my experience has been that the cheaper the project, the more weary it gets and the more likely they are to bounce, especially if there's no deposit. And so, especially in my first, my earliest years, I was like, oh, I'm only charging them 200 bucks. There's no way they're going to like call me at the last minute and just be like, oh, sorry, I can't make it. Like, but no, that happens. <laughs> that happens at $200 budgets, but it doesn't happen at $10,000 budgets because with a $10,000 budget, there's a pretty hefty deposit that has to be put down. And that's why I believe that at no matter what price point you are at, you should be getting some kind of a deposit. And if you feel uncomfortable getting a deposit, you're like, I haven't done anything. I feel guilty, blah, blah, blah. Just literally charge them 50 bucks to just hold the date on your calendar. That's it. Just tell them like, hey, there's a $50 deposit that just holds your date on my calendar. And then when the job's done, you can charge them the remaining balance, whatever y'all agreed on. But absolutely get a deposit and tell them if they start asking for too much, just say it's currently at this rate out of scope. But I would love to add it in. Can I send you over a quote to add in whatever that addition might be? Takes it off of you. Now it's on the client. They get a chance to decide if they want it or not. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, we were actually on a shoot yesterday. And it's so funny. Like, I trend to be like a... Uh, you're a nice person, Brandon, but like on set, you're very direct and focused. And so, uh, <laughs> like, to me, like, oh, this has happened so many times where I'm like, trying to very much please the client, you know, trying to very much trying to make it as amicable as possible. And Brandon, you just have a different sort of like, this is the scope. And I see you practice it. And it saves you because honestly, like, you're only you're doing what they've what they've asked for. Like, if you guys initially set up, this is the scope of the project this is what we're going to do. Uh, you're doing that. And the only person that gets hurt in that situation, if you go outside of the scope is you. Uh, they're going to be happy. They're going to be super grateful, but you're going to work more hours. You're going to do more. And then you'll start building up this bitterness towards them. And so you really kind of protect yourself by 
by doing it. So that's really good advice. Well, not only that, but you protect the whole project. I mean, if you have a client that's like really adamant, like here's what I tell them. Like, for example, let's take your photography job as an example, and then we'll move on to another question because I know there's other ones that are popping off in the chat right now. But, um, you know, if a client asks you to come do photos and let's say it's going to take you two hours, right, to do those photos uh, and you charge them $500 to do those photos and then they ask for more stuff, right? But you still have only allocated those two hours. Well, now their photos are going to suffer because the truth is, is that you can't cram more work into a an allotment of time and get the same quality of work out of what you originally had put into that time. Something is going to suffer. And so what you're really doing by charging the client more so that way you can allocate whether more time or more resources, bring on a second shooter, whatever, is you're actually protecting their project, right? And so if you have a client that's like pushing back on like the budget or something like that, just let them know like, hey, no, I'm the reason why I have to do this is because there's a certain standard that I know that you as my client is looking for because that's why you hired me because you saw my other stuff and like you want that same quality. So if you want me to provide the same quality that I've given other people and you're looking for the same thing, then I have to charge you more. But it's not because I want to. It's because you actually as a client want this certain level of service. Like yesterday when we were at our job and the client started asking for more stuff and more stuff. I was very firm in what I told him. And the reason why I was firm was because we already had an agreement and we had built a plan for what he was looking for. And so if we hadn't like really dived in and made sure and I like stayed firm to what we had agreed on, then what he originally wanted could have suffered. And I knew that wouldn't have made him happy. It definitely wouldn't have made us happy. So you're protecting the original project when you do that. So highly recommend if somebody tries to go out of scope, let them know what they're asking for is out of scope. Uh, so then that way, you know, you're protecting the project overall. Sorry, Terry. Out of scope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got a question from Juan. How to break out from a full-time video role for a company and go freelance? Ooh, ooh, ooh. So I have to say, I, I never made that jump. And I want to be very clear when I give this advice. Um, for me, I worked for Apple full time actually, and left Apple to go freelance. And so I started my full time creator job as a freelancer. However, here's the one thing I would say is as a freelancer, you are going to need help. Like nobody does this journey alone. You might be able to one man ban it for a few years, but I promise you're just going to be limping the entire time because just like a horse needs four legs, it takes it takes a lot to run a video production company. I mean, they say lights, camera, action. That's just two roles, but there's actually like 20 plus other roles that are needed on set. And so the reason why I bring this up is if you are going to leave your video production company, make sure you leave on good terms because the truth is, is that you may actually need their help in the future. So that's the first thing. The second thing is there's always going to be a conflict of interest or there might be a perceived conflict of interest when you try to go it on your own. And so my advice would probably be to maybe go after clients that don't 100% conflict with your existing job because I'd hate for you to pre prematurely get let go because you're there's a conflict of interest. And that's normal with any job. Anytime you have a job, if there's a conflict of interest, you're going to run into issues. And so I would definitely go after another group. Like, for example, if you're video production company shoots weddings, then maybe you go shoot music videos, something that's so polar different that your boss doesn't feel like you're like, you know, possibly taking clients away from the company. And then the last piece of advice I would give you is just really focus on building repeatable business. Because the hardest thing that happens when you go for freelance is you have all the gear and you have all the knowledge, but you don't have repeatable business. And without repeatable business, it's hard to get a decent amount of cash flow. So I would go look for clients that you can put on a retainer, especially at the beginning. So that way you can have sustainable income coming in. Um, bonus tip, save up as much money as you possibly can because it's the, the waters are definitely choppiest when you're leaving the beach. But once you get past the waves, it normally flattens out and it becomes much easier to, to move. So I would definitely put some cash in the bank to deal with the waves uh, because they will happen. It happens to everybody. But once you get past those waves, 
uh, and you have some some repeatable business, you have some sustainable income coming in, it makes it much easier to to make that jump. That's a great transition into our next question. Talk about how we can aim for transitioning clients from being one-time project-based to more consistent retainer clients. I know for me in this, one of the things that I did, you kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. If a client comes to you and they're asking for a video, a video, what I find is, is they're thinking about, they're hoping that this one ad, that this one video is going to bring them in millions and billions of dollars. And if you've been doing this long enough, you know that even if you create an incredible ad or an incredible video for them, even if it's golden, it's not guaranteed to bring in to solve all of their problems. They may have way bigger problems than that one video can provide. And so one of the things that I do uh, is what Brandon was talking about is, is if you if you learn how to solve their problems, you will become valuable and they will want to keep you on retainer. And so you can't just literally just be a video guy. You know, you kind of need to wear a little bit of a marketing hat or you kind of need to be a really good problem solver or you need to be able to show them, hey, this one video, while it may reach this demographic, really, we we need to reach. We need to we need to drip on these people, multiple pieces of content if we're really going to get their intention, if if this project is worth it. If it's going to cause your business to make a lot of money, then it deserves the time and attention of not a a video, but a series of videos. And so what I find is be valuable to your client to the point where they're like, man, I want to keep you around because you have a vision or plan or ideas for that client's future. Yeah. And I actually, I'll, I'm actually going to take one step back though. Mm -hmm. Cause here, here's the here's the truth, is that when a client reaches out to you about doing a project for them, the truth is is that there's actually like, there there's a partnership that has to be created there, right? So everything that Jarrell says, I 100% agree with. However, there's one part of this question that kind of like made me think a little bit, and that is the taking a client from being a one time project based to that retainer. And the truth is is I personally think that every client that you work with for the first time should be a one-time client. Mm. That might be a hot take, but I think they should be a one-time client. And here's the reason why. What if you don't like them? Like the truth, <laughs> like, like the so truth true. is, the truth is that you may not like them. They may be, you know, a jerk or they may be over demanding or they may ask for way too many edits or you're constantly having to like pull them back into scope to where it's not even worth it. So for me, I personally believe that the first time you work with someone, it should be a one-time basis. And if you like them and they like you and the project was smooth, then you need to work hard to get them on retainer. And then you do everything that Jarrell was talking about. You figure out how to solve their problem over multiple pieces of content because the truth is, is that's probably what's necessary anyway. But I actually don't recommend that you try to put somebody on a retainer from the jump because I did that. You know, I signed somebody up for a retainer, retainer right off jump. It was a three month retainer and they were a nightmare to deal with. And I was stuck. I was stuck dealing with them for three months. And then to try to tell somebody that you don't necessarily want to take them on after three months of working with them, way harder of a conversation than if it's a one time project. Because if it's a one-time project and then they come back and they're like, hey, this worked really well on my end. Can you take on a retainer? It's very easy to just say, hey, sorry, at this time, we, we don't have room to take on any more retainer clients, but let us know if you have one-off projects. That's way easier to say than if you've been working with somebody for three months and they're like, these last three months have been amazing. Let's keep going. It's like it's like breaking up with someone after a long-term relationship versus just like, you know, not asking for a second date. It's just way easier to let the second date go than it is to try to break up with someone after three months. So that's just my last little nugget I will add in there. That's maybe a personal thing. So do whatever you think is best for you. But to Jarrell's point, yeah, instead of focusing, if you do want to take somebody to more of a retainer, don't think about it as a video. Think about it as a campaign. And I'm actually going to give Mr. Camera Junkie the credit for that one because that is exactly what I would say go ahead and do. 
That's so good. Yeah, I like that a lot. Well, hey, we're going to get to as many questions as we can. There are so many questions, and I'm just like, oh, my goodness. But with that being said, we're going to do a short one this time, and it is actually coming from... I'm not even going to pronounce the name, but <laughs> yeah, it's coming from you. Do you or should you use Adobe Premiere or Final Cut for post-production? Brandon and I are kind of split on this. Okay, we're only split because we both, uh, we just use what works. Yeah. I think, and that's and that's going to be my answer. Use what works. I personally like Final Cut because, as I mentioned, I, w- I worked at Apple for many years, and they trained me and paid me to get trained in Final Cut. So I became very proficient at it. So I'm very good at it. But that said, I do also use Premiere as well. Jarrell edits in Premiere. I think that you should use whichever editor provides you the tools that you are looking for the most and that you can get the job done. At the end of the day, your client or whoever watches your video, your YouTube audience, your social media audience, whatever you're editing, they'll never know. So I personally say just pick one and then run with it. Couple pros and cons. Premiere has probably more, not even probably. Crashes. Has more, well, well, I wasn't going to go there yet. <laughs> but I was going to say Premiere has more features than Final Cut does. But the cons are more features more crashes more crashes. so you have more chances of you know project failures and things like that so final cut is definitely more stable um but premiere is available on windows and mac so if you ever decide to leave the apple ecosystem you have that as an option but uh, here's here's the there's thing that, a huge pro for final cut okay that i don't that i haven't personally i, was that I started pun? in was that a pun did you say i, there's I a don't huge even know what pro? i said you said there's a huge I, pro for final cut <laughs> Pro. Okay, sorry. So that jokes. That jokes. Uh, my bad. I we would love to know what you guys use in the comments. If you're an editor, you're a content creator, let us know. What do you use in the comments right now? But I actually started on Final Cut 3, like back in the prehistoric days, uh, but then transitioned over to Adobe. But one thing that I love about me some Final Cut is it is so fast. It oh, is yeah. so much faster than Premiere. Oh my goodness. And that that means that means everything in editing. Uh it, your ability to edit footage quickly and then also be able to render it quickly, it's everything. Yeah, no, 100%. Okay, but now here's here's the last thing and I'm I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole cuz we need to move to the next question. But although I use a lot of Final Cut primarily and you use Premiere primarily, What's the software, Jarrell, that we always talk about both of us switching to? Well, I'm going to throw it up. I'm going to throw it up. <laughs> there it is. And yeah, we both feel in our hearts that right now DaVinci is killing the game. And 100%. Oh, my goodness. With, with Adobe stomping me in the teeth every month, $60 a month, like, that's one reason, but the features on DaVinci are incre- insane, incredible. So, yeah, we both need to we both need to go there. Yep, it's 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 probably about time. It's definitely about time. All right, let's run up another question. Yeah, so let's see. Um, I we are so we're so backlogged, but uh, this is, seems like a good one. How can I get into corporate video production? I want to film internal training videos, testimonials, videos, etc. I feel like a broken record here, man. I, I really do. I mean, okay, so no matter what the industry that you're trying to get into, there's a couple things you're going to need to do. The first is 100% have something to show them. So let me let me start it off there. If you are trying to get into corporate video, then you need to have corporate videos for those corporations to see. So, and this doesn't mean you have to go shoot one necessarily for a company for free, but you need to create something that they can see and to show that you are capable of doing what they're asking for. And so this might be, shoot one for yourself. Actually, this is one thing that I think videographers should absolutely be doing. Everybody take a note right now that if your company doesn't have its own video that promotes what your company does as a videographer, go make that video and make it the best video you have ever made. Because the truth is, is that you can show how you make corporate videos by showing how good your own corporate video is. And I absolutely think that that should be one of the first things that you do so if you are able to do that 
first off, foremost, go do that. Even with testimonials, go call up some of your past clients and do testimonials for your own business and let your clients see how good you are at making this type of content, but for your own content, because secretly what you're going to be doing is like tricking them slash marketing to them how good you are by showing them your own testimonials and by showing them your own video about your corporation. So that's absolutely what I would do to get started because no matter what company you try to go shoot for, they're going to want to see examples of what you've done before. And that's honestly my best, that's my best piece of advice. That's, that was off the dome. That was actually off the dome. Um, but that's absolutely what I think is the best solution. From there, the same as earlier, go find a, go find a corporation or a company that has a problem that needs solving. That video would be the solution. And then go pitch that solution. But that's, that's probably going to be my, my piece of advice. If you have a video company and you've never shot a commercial for your own company, go and do that. And I'm not talking about a demo reel because how pretty your shots are aren't necessarily going to win you jobs. I'm talking about actually create a video that talks about the services that you provide and that what makes you different. And that's what's going to help. That's so good. All right. From Elijah, any tips for beginners who are setting up their website? I'm going to give you just a quick tip. Uh, I use both Squarespace and Wix. Personally, I think Squarespace does a little bit better job, but I use both for different clients. They are both so, and this is not sponsored, by the way, unless, do they sponsor you? No. Okay. No, yeah, this not, is not, not sponsored. Not sponsored, <laughs> not not sponsored at all. Squarespace. <laughs> Actually, the Creative Film Academy sponsored. <laughs> yeah. Squarespace genuinely uh, sponsors a lot of people, but this is not sponsored. Okay. So, but what I find is Squarespace is so easy. Like, and when I say easy, it's easy if you're if you're good with like with computers. So I'm not saying it's easy for everyone, but if you if you take and make good content, uh, it's drag and drop, you know, that with a little bit of chat GPT for writing the copy on your website, you can set up something really great. My one piece of advice outside of using one of those two platforms is uh, do not copy someone else's website, but mm. get inspiration from someone that is seemingly killing the game. Like if you know of a video production company or a freelancer that has an incredible website and it seems like they're getting a lot of business, go in their website, take down some notes, see where they're doing their call to action, see like how many times they're putting in their contact info, you know, sh look at where they're putting their demo reel, look to see art, do they have their prices on their website or do they not? And then literally, if they're killing the game and you look at several different ones, then begin to emulate a little bit about what they're doing. But any other tips you have, Brandon? Yeah, so I love when you give your advice because it allows me to go like the complete opposite direction. Yeah. So I love the, I love this polar oppositeness here. So here's what here's my piece of advice. Um, maybe you don't need a website. Ooh, hot take. Oh, hot take. Here we go. Um, so depending on who your audience is or who your potential client might be, it might actually be more valuable and more beneficial for you to really just focus on your social media. See, the truth is, it's like depending on who you're going after, they might actually spend more time on social media. Than What's your generation, on Brandon? The website, huh? What's your generation? Uh, I'm a millennial, I believe. Oh, I believe that's I, I wow. believe that's where I'm at. Super so, hot take. But no, but here's here's my thought though. Here's my thought though. It all comes down to who you're trying to attract, right? So, for example, if I was going after corporations and like you know big big ticket companies, like here we're based in Houston, so like oil and gas or the are going after um uh like medical stuff like that i would 100 percent have an amazing baller website it would have to be like a banger great however um if i was going after companies that primarily do most of their marketing on social media i would prioritize my social media over my website that's not saying i wouldn't have a website but i would make sure that my social media is the priority because the truth is is that as a business you can only focus on so many things at once so you can either build a great social media platform or you can build an amazing website but the hours spent is the hours spent time is the ultimate resource so from there i would really focus on based off of who you're trying to attract 
to know if you should focus on building an amazing TikTok, an amazing Instagram, or an amazing website, because the time is going to have to be invested somewhere. So think about who you're trying to attract, figure out where they're spending most of their time, and then invest making that platform the best it could be, because that could be a website, but it could just be a social media page. I'm just saying. Yeah, that's so good. Like, I think about the different clients that I approach and they want different things. And I think the cool thing about the social media route is, especially if you get tons of views, tons of likes, oftentimes showing that to someone, even before they even see the quality of your work, let's say you have 10,000 views on something or 20,000 views, or you have several thousand likes, that's gonna be way more appealing to a company that they're going to be like, oh, you create stuff that gets out there. And so, yeah, I think that that's actually really good. It's like that social proof. I like that a lot. All right. Next question as we keep rolling. Uh, what would your approach be on getting bigger clients shooting on a red? I'm guessing that's a question mark. We know that Brandon shoots and has a lot of red camera gear, but do you think it okay, I have two, there is two red? reds. <laughs> there are two reds. You don't, Bro, don't make it don't if, make it sound crazy. If you have a raptor, you have a lot of red. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's kind of true. Seasons. Seasons. Um, okay, so here's the, here's my biggest thing. And this is a mistake that I actually made, and I'm gonna be a little vulnerable here. Uh, even though people told me this was true, I was like, I'm different. It's gonna be different for me. I know how to market better. Um, there was this idea that if I had a red, uh, and this was when I was looking at the Komodo originally, I was like, oh, having a red might make me a bit more valuable to some of those higher tier clients. But I already told you guys why that doesn't work, because they don't care about the gear. What they care about is the solution to their problem. So here is the thing is that when it comes to shooting on a red and trying to acquire those bigger clients, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you actually go about working on finding those bigger clients first and just rent your reds. The truth is, is that yes, reds bring a ton of value to a production. One, it almost guarantees that you have as much latitude as you can possibly have in post to ensure that all the money that's being spent to bring this whole production together doesn't fall apart because your camera can't keep up. And so that's the thing about getting a red. And the reason why reds are used on such high-end productions is because there is a, there's a provenness to the red and also this ability by being able to shoot in raw, compress raw, and have all the latitude that the reds give you that if you are spending, you know, five, ten, twenty thousand dollars on a production, you don't want your camera to not be able to handle the dynamic range. You don't want your camera to overheat. You don't want to have a lack of resolution so that way you can punch in and make sure that you're getting all the different angles you can get. This is the reason why you go with a higher end camera. Now that said, Red, like that is a great camera and a lot of other cameras can still handle these types of jobs. But there's also this like sense of like, just like, like this sigh of relief for the client when they see a bigger camera on set and a nicer production being taken taken towards their project because they know that their their dollars and that they are like their dollars being spent are being spent on the right thing and that the company that's shooting their project actually cares to make sure that the project turns out well. And so that is the benefit of shooting on a red, but I will say that having a red does not guarantee that bigger clients are going to be looking at you. Everything we've talked about in this live stream up until this point, it's still incredibly true. You have to make sure that you're solving their problem. You have to make sure that you are providing them with videos that are going to, again, aid to that and that they ultimately have the budget to be able to justify that type of a production. Because even just yesterday, Jarrell, what did I say? We were on our way to that job and I was like, man, I really want to shoot this on a red, but between the cost of storage and the additional accessories and everything I'd have to pack, the budget for this project doesn't really make sense to use the red. So yesterday, the red stayed home. It just wasn't needed for that type of a project. Yeah, it's very much a yes and no, what I find. Like, yes, do you? It's kind of like, what did they, when they brought the Tesseract to Earth on Marvels and they're like, you're messing with power and you're signaling to the universe or something. Like, I feel like when you do get a bigger camera, 
like or even a more high-end camera you do kind of signal to the world that you're ready to take on certain things whether you are or you aren't but it will not know just have make clients knocking on your door like i heard you have a red here's fifty thousand dollars we have this project <laughs> that's just Dude, if not only, happening <laughs> if only it was that easy dude oh man no, yeah definitely not that easy so yeah so don't like what i find is because i recently picked up a c70 and i love it it's an incredible camera but one of the things that made it worth it to me is oftentimes as like a filmmaker we plateau like we'll grow and we'll grow and we'll grow and then we'll plateau for such a long time but then what i find is is when you buy new gear there's the excitement and there's the joy of buying the gear and that's awesome but there goes back to like going back to school learning the best settings, learning the best codecs, learning how to color grade that new footage, that all of a sudden you go back into a posture of being a student. And when you do that, you oftentimes level up. You might even buy a course when you didn't buy a course. Shameless plug, go to the CFA. Uh, you might go <laughs> buy, you might go, you might, you might want to learn how to use that camera. And then what I find is, is once you're active again, you start posting on social media that, hey, you're proud of your projects and you're doing stuff, that's when people are seeing you and then all of a sudden they're saying, oh, wow, this person's still shooting video and they're doing projects and, oh, that looks really cool and that looks really good. And they start reaching out to you. Was it the camera? Yeah, it was the camera, but oftentimes it's you getting reinvigorated, passionate about what you're doing and it just kind of you know jumps you back into it. Dude, that's so that you know I've never put those things together in my head, but that is very true. You know, even when we got the Komodo X early, like I was so excited about shooting with the Komodo X that we went out and shot projects that like I would have never put together if I hadn't had that camera. And it was because I had that camera, I was like, oh, we got to put the best foot forward with this camera, which really pushed us. Which then makes you think like, oh, was it the camera or was it the projects? I think it was a little bit of both. Um, I, I do want to say something really quick because I've noticed something in this live stream. So if you have gotten any value from this live stream, do us a huge favor and hit the like button. YouTube is one of those weird places where it's all algorithm based and you have to feed the algorithm. But one thing that the audience can do that can really help feed the algorithm to let them know that this live stream was actually valuable is hitting the like button. I know currently we have just over 70 people here on the live stream, which is amazing. And I'm so happy that you guys are here and that you guys are getting value from this stream. But if you are providing or if you've gotten any value from this live stream, please do me a huge favor, hit the like button. So that way, hopefully it can get out to other filmmakers because I, you know, I put this information out there, but I want anyone to have it. That's the reason why it's here on YouTube. So, so that it can get out there to more people, please do me a huge favor, hit that like button. So that way more people can know about this live stream. Maybe they'll join us, but even on the replay, they'll at least know that it's here. Yeah, no, this is good. Yeah, I think we're getting close to the end, but... I do love this question as kind of a like a bridge, a segue uh, from the last question is what's your opinion on renting versus purchasing equipment? Uh, they've gotten really lucky making some investments for gear, um, but there's always that stress of things not working out. And what I love about this question is, is renting was never on my mind like two or three years ago. Like you go on YouTube, you see these incredible reviews, paid reviews, <laughs> you see all these incredible <laughs> paid reviews about these cameras and you think this camera, this piece of gear is going to change your life. You go out and buy it and I'm pretty sure we can all, if you're a filmmaker, you can probably list five to 10 pieces of gear that are collecting dust right now. Like whether it's filters or it's whatever, like that you're just like you thought this lens was going to change the game and it just it, it 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 you don't use it. So uh I'm a huge proponent now of renting before you buy. What about you Brandon? Yeah, 100%. I mean, first of all, you should never purchase anything that's going to put you in a financial stronghold. Uh so I would highly highly recommend that like especially if you can't afford it or if you're buying it with the hope that you're going to be able to pay this thing back off with the clients that you have coming. Um, definitely rent it. The other thing is that like, there's something to like a piece of gear being phenomenal, but sometimes a phenomenal piece of gear 
can ruin your creative workflow. The Raptor was actually one of those pieces of gear. When I actually originally purchased my Komodo, I was using it and things were going well and I was getting better clients and I was enjoying it and things were great, but I started to use a lot more storage. And then I bought the Raptor thinking, I got compressed raw, it's not gonna be that bad. How bad could AK really be? The Raptor cost me over $10,000 in storage because I had to buy a whole NAS system in order to even support it. And this is one of those things I probably would have learned had I rented it before buying it. But the truth is, is that sometimes even a great piece of gear can throw off the workflow. And so by renting something, you can also learn how does this actually work with my system? For example, rent a camera and edit the footage off of it. You'll learn, can my computer actually handle this? Like, or is this file type going to be too much for me to manage? Lenses. Let me actually get this lens and shoot with it. Oh, okay, the autofocus isn't as good as I thought it was going to be. Or maybe there's too much wobble if I use it on a gimbal. Or the truth might be is that you, if you honestly look at like how often you're using certain pieces of gear, you're just not picking it up as much as you thought. So in a year's time, you might actually only use it maybe five, six times. That's totally worth renting. Because on those five to six times that you rented it, you wouldn't have actually even paid for it had you put that money towards buying it. So my personal recommendation is always to rent and then rent until you're using it so often that you know that you're going to be able to like, you know, obviously get your money's worth out of it. Or if you're buying something to replace something that's already working within your workflow and system, but you know how it's going to work. Like, for example, you know, if you have a Canon R6 Mark I and they come out with an R6 Mark II that solves a bunch of problems that you already have, you know it's going to just be able to drop right into your, your flow and you're going to be able to, like, continue to work with it. That's when I would make a decision to just buy something over renting it. But otherwise, if you're on the fence and you're like, should I buy this? Should I rent this? If you're asking yourself that question, just go ahead and rent it first just to be safe. That's good. Hey, so this is... The last final plug for the CFA, the Creative Fam Academy is an academy that we've created to be able to help you literally grow in your business. And oftentimes what I find is, is YouTube does a pretty good job of a little tip here, a little tip there, a little strategy here, but oftentimes it becomes confusing of what should I implement and when should I implement it? And will is this good at my my stage and my size of company? And what I love about the business guide for creative professionals is literally no matter where you're at in your journey, like Brandon has created multiple successful businesses. And so it's not like you're getting information from this person or this person, this person. He's showing you the roadmap of his successes and failures to be able to help you grow in your business. And so with that being said, Definitely, definitely, definitely. If you have not had an opportunity to check out the Creative Fam Academy and all of the different guides and courses that are on it, we really want to urge you go over to the creativefam.com and academy.com and then literally check it out because, and I'm sure we'll be posting a link in the in the deal. Hey, I think Brandon, are we are we close? Do you want to answer one more question? What do you think? Yeah, I, I do want to answer one more question, but like uh, one thing that, you know, I think is super important for people who are considering the Creative Fam Academy is like, I know a lot of times when it comes to the Creative Fam Academy or when it comes to, you know, courses, um, there's this idea of, you know, buy my course and it's going to, you know, it's going to be the end all be all. And you pay thousands of dollars for it. I, I want to be very clear about the Creative Fam Academy and its intentions. First of all, the Creative Fam Academy is not a single course. It is like, it is an entire online platform with guides for a lot of things. I mean, yes, we've been talking a lot about business today. And yes, there is an entire guide on business, but we have entire guides on real estate. We have entire guides on lighting and lenses and the purpose and the weddings. reason why your know, wedding, like the reason why we built it this way was because like as a videographer, as a creator, you are probably going to have to dabble in different industries. I think there's been multiple questions here about people who want to get into corporate, which means they're doing something else. You know, I started in weddings and then I did commercial and then I did 
interviews and then I've also done weddings and I've also done music videos, although I don't like music videos. Um, <laughs> I've done all these different things because as a creator, your journey is going to cause you to have to kind of like move like a river and kind of flow around these obstacles, rocks, in order to get to that next journey. Because there's sometimes like right now, I'll be honest with you, real estate, even though we did shoot a pretty decent sized real estate project yesterday, um, Real estate's kind of slowed down right now because of the market and whatnot. And so what does that mean? That means we have to pivot into other industries. You know, Jarrell, you just finished up uh, a shoot for a Nutcracker, which is a very seasonal thing, right? So that's shooting something that's very seasonal. But then like in three months, that job's not going to be there anymore. So I think as creators, it's super important for us to be able to navigate through different industries. And that's the reason why we set up the Creative Film Academy the way we did. Uh, and of course, if anyone's like, okay, Brandon, so you're pitching your $1,000 course. That's not $1,000. It's literally 20 bucks a month. And the reason why we set it up that way is because I want you guys to be able to use it for as long as you need it, but then also know that we're there for you for the journey. And probably my favorite thing is that we also have a community page, which is like literally a 24 seven chat. In fact, I just want to quickly give a shout out to Oliver and I want to give a shout out to everyone who's currently watching this live stream right now on the Creative Fam Academy because we do have the live streams over on the Creative Fam Academy and I do answer questions in the chat. Uh, and next week, something special that we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be allowing you guys to submit video questions for the live stream. So that way we can bring you guys up uh, here. And so we're going to be doing that through the Creative Fam Academy. So there's just so many different benefits to being a member of the Creative Fam Academy. It's not just about you know, an individual course. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of what it was. But yes, let's go ahead. Let's answer one more question. One more question. Hey, Justin, thank you for being so patient with us. We know that you have been posting this question. We want to do it. How many times do you get a no when reaching out to clients versus a yes when you are first starting? Assuming we are the ones cold calling, cold emailing, that sort of deal. So what... What has that journey been like for you, Brennan? So I can say for one specific situation, when I was trying to get into the CrossFit space, um, I and this I didn't even send out cold emails. I actually was like showing up in person to these gyms. And I think I went into about maybe six gyms before. And don't, I, don't miss that, guys. That's an actual tip, right? Like he, he's just saying it like it's like a normal thing. Oftentimes, especially CrossFit people, they're busy. They're very involved in what they do. And so if you're not getting an email or if you're not getting responses to your email, go literally go introduce yourself. Yeah. But yeah, no, I just I think I went into about seven boxes. That's what they call CrossFit gyms. I went in about seven boxes before I got one that actually told me yes. And the truth is, is that I was ready to go into every single box in Houston. The the problem, not necessarily problem, but the one thing I would strongly recommend when it comes to cold reach outs, and this is a piece of advice I think everyone can take, is, uh, hey, Jarrell, by the way, someone's saying that the 25 days of Christmas link is not valid. So can we update that? Because, sure. I mean, we're giving away free gear. They need to have the link for that. Yes. Uh, but, um, and let's just make sure we just send it directly. I don't care how they get there. Let's make sure. We got free gear to give away, guys. By the way, a lot of people have dropped out of the live stream because I know we said we're almost done. Um, stick around because there's there's a special giveaway for those of you who stuck around. Um, but I will say, if you are trying to get those cold reach outs, one thing I would strongly recommend you do is maybe reach out by trying to slowly warm them up. And what I mean by that is when you're sending out a cold email, if you're just copying and pasting and sending out an email to each individual person that you're trying to reach out to, we all know what that looks like. I mean, you guys probably get spam emails all the time trying to get you to buy something from Best Buy or Amazon or whoever. Like, you know when you're just being marketed to. And depending on what time of day or what you're doing, you may or may not look at that, right? So what I would recommend you do is make your emails just a tad bit personal and it will go a super long way. And what I mean by that is, for example, when I used to reach out to real estate agents, I would not just be like, hey, I like to shoot real estate videos and you're a realtor. I want to work with you. Here's how much I charge. Book me. They don't care. Like they will not care. However, 
if you do just a tad bit of research, like for example, what I would do is I would go on to here in Houston, we have what's called HAR, which is like the Houston Association of Real Estate. And that's where all the listings go. Um, but whatever your thing is, go do some research. And what I would do is I would go to HAR. I would find realtors who had homes that had been on the market for over 30 days, which means this house ain't moving. They need some help. Like no realtor wants a house to sit for 30 days. And when I would send them an email, it wouldn't be quite as cold. It would be a bit warmer because I would say, hey, Rachel, I saw that you had this home at whatever, whatever, whatever address, and it's currently been sitting on the market for over 30 days. I understand how difficult and stressful it can be to sell real estate in this market. And so I'd like to help you get an edge on getting this house moved. Video is a fantastic way to actually go about moving homes and to get more excitement around the house. And this is exactly what I can do for you. Now, my email is special because the truth is, is like the second half of that email is copied and paste. But the first half of that email is actually very specific to them because now I'm not just like Cole reaching out. I'm actually trying to help them solve their problem. This is going to be different depending on the industry that you're looking at, but a couple easy cues you can do, go look at their social media. And if their social media videos are terrible, mention that. Hey, I went to your Instagram. I saw you currently have, you know, 200 followers and your last five videos got an average of 200 views. How would you like to quadruple those numbers? Blah, 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 blah. And they'll pitch your service. When you send emails like that, or here is like a crazy tip. Don't send an email, send them a video, like send them a DM with a video. Um, but if, when you send them personalized messages like that, you look way different than everybody else who's sending them cold emails to do their video projects. When you do it like that, now you go from having to send maybe like 10 to get one to like maybe sending four to get one. It literally does change the game because the truth is, is when you take the time to do a little bit of research for them and you build them a plan that's going to help them be successful, it's harder for them to say no because one, you've already proven yourself that you know what you're talking about. But then two, you also make them feel obligated to give you a shot because you're different than everybody else. They're like, if he did all this when he reached out to me, what could he do when he actually wants to work with me? Okay, Justin, you got my business. Let's go to work. That's that's the way that I would do it. And I find that that is by far the best way. So that's my opinion, Jarrell. Definitely. When I was grinding, like grinding really hard, one of the things that I did, and you can use Descript. I mean, you can. there's so many different like programs that you do where you can like show your screen and also show your face, is I literally would go to their website or I would go to their social media page and literally just do like a quick minute, five, three to five minute evaluation. And literally the evaluation, you're not being super hardcore. You're not being like, oh, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. So doing a screen recording, I would literally go through and be like, wow, I see that you do a really great job when you post at engagement. It seems like a lot of people are engaging with your deal. You, you figured that part out. And so I would compliment, compliment, compliment. And at the end, I would say one of the things that I feel like is good that would be that you, that you can improve upon is consistency. And one of the hardest things about being consistent is literally um, is having someone to be able to create the content for you and post it for you. This is a service that I offer if you're interested. And to me, I sent out these videos to real estate agents. I sent it out to gym owners and it took me like maybe like five minutes. But what I found, especially if I sent it directly into their messenger or I found a way to send it to their email, when I sent them a personalized video of me evaluating their business, they almost, they, they had to be sucked in because they needed to know what someone thought about them. They needed to know somebody's feedback. And to me, I don't even love emails. Thank the Lord for chat GPT. But like I could literally sit in front of a camera and I can talk. Oh, this is something that you're doing. And so if you're if you have time, you're sitting around and you're looking to generate business, I want to suggest the video screen recording of of their social medias or their website in ways that you can solve problems for them because they may have that that 
like I know I don't love my website or I know I don't love my social media, but uh, they might not think that it's a problem yet that needs to be solved. And so you literally presenting that internal voice inside of them that, yeah, you can help them solve that problem. They may go from inaction to action. Yeah. And the best part there is that you're also like you're just starting the conversation. As we know, a lot of times the reason why we have to do cold emails is because there's no conversation going. So the purpose of what we're talking about here is just to start the conversation. Know that that just because what you emailed them is a problem that you think that you could solve for them, you, it may not be the one they want solved right now, but it starts the conversation and that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to go from having a cold lead, warm them up with the type of like engaging email that both of us just talked about or video, and then you make them red hot when you get them on the call because then you can ask them, what are your pain points? What are the problems that you're having? And here's another bonus point, and this is like kind of like getting super technical, so hopefully you guys find value in this. But in the email that you send them, there's a website called Calendly. I'm not sponsored, but I should be. But there's a, <laughs> there's a website called Calendly where you can link your Zoom account to them or I think Google Hangout as well, but I do Zoom. And literally, they can schedule a call with you from that email. Don't make them email you back. Let them like tell them the call to action is to schedule a call with me right now. So when they watch that email and they're excited and they're like, yo, this guy is amazing. I want to work with him. Hey, if you're interested in moving forward, click this link right now, schedule a call with me. It pops up. It shows their Google Calendar. It shows your Google Calendar. And they can pick a time slot that you can like predetermine and they'll just, they'll book it. And that's honestly, like, when we talk about systematizing, like, this is the kind of things that we teach in the Creative Femme Academy, like, systematizing the business in this way, dude, you're going to see a huge change in your business. So that that is exactly what I would recommend. Justin, I'm, I'm glad that you, you love these questions or that you love the answers to these questions. Um, and I'm glad these were super helpful. Like I said, I try to get technical, especially on these live streams. Um, because it's 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 absolutely the best. Uh, Mr. Camera Junkie says that he uses Calendly with Ecamm. So yeah, just lots of creators are actually using it. We're just trying not to gatekeep, and we're trying to make sure that you guys have all of the value that you could possibly get. Okay. Love that. Brandon, did you say giveaway? We did. We're, we need to talk about the what? 25 days of Christmas for just a moment. Can we pop that up? Let's pop that up. It's up. 25 days of Christmas. All right, so for anyone who is here and who has not been a part of the 25 days of Christmas yet, a uh, couple quick things. One, every single day for the month of December, we are giving away items for the 25 days of Christmas. So the first all the way through the end of the month, uh, or I guess to the 25th, sorry, we are giving away a new item, items that have currently been given away, gimbals, lights, uh, color checkers, camera bags. What else is up there, Jarrell? I can't see everything. What else oh, do we have? What else we have? I can't away? see it either. Uh, <laughs> okay, we got a calendar, but it's far across the room. Um, but we have given away so much stuff so far, and so really, really glad that we've been able to do that. But we have more items to give away for the rest of the month, including. And I know there have been some questions about red on this live stream, and maybe you guys have seen the promo videos. But yes, we are working with red. Red Digital Camera, the actual company that makes the Red Komodo X. And we're working with them to get the Red Komodo X into the hands of one lucky winner. And so there are a couple of things. There was a question earlier about, you know, is this a U.S. only thing? It's not U.S., but there are three countries. It's U.S., Canada, and the U.K. And I'm sorry for anyone else who's not in those because, unfortunately, it has a lot to do with uh, just shipping but when it comes to the red camera, we're we're giving away the access to be able to utilize it. Red has agreed to do a six week loaner on the Komodo X, and they are going to ship this camera directly to you. They're going to handle all the logistics of that. Um, but the purpose of this is because I know, like I said earlier, you should rent something before you buy it. And I know getting access and even renting a red is so expensive that I wanted to try to get my hands on a red that I could get into you guys' hands. And so that is the reason why we're partnering up with red in order to do this, uh, because logistically, it's just easier to do it that way. Now, that said, 
Um, there has been a huge issue of, and not necessarily an issue, but there's just been a lot of people who have been, you know, asking for, uh, how do I put this? Like they've just been, they've been wanting international giveaways and international giveaways are extremely hard to do because of the shipping. That said, we're going to do something, Jarrell, that I don't think you know about, but I'm bringing back a throwback. I'm going to bring back a throwback. So in the past, in live streams from about like two years ago, what I used to do was whoever was providing value in the chat, Ooh. that person Ooh. would win the giveaway. And the winner of the giveaway would actually be chosen by one of you guys. So today we're going to actually be giving away a licensed subscription to Musicbed. So this is a one-year subscription Ooh. to Musicbed. And this subscription does not, it's, it's international. So as long as you have Musicbed, you can absolutely use it. And we will contact Musicbed and they will get you signed up. So if you already have a Musicbed account, that's totally fine. We'll get your email address and we'll make sure that you have the account all set up. But we're going to be giving away a one-year subscription to Musicbed. And so what I want you guys to do right now, as we start to wrap this live stream up, is let me know in the comments who has provided you the most value? And I'm not talking about me or Jarrell. I'm talking about other members give inside me the, subscription, the Brandon. chat. What'd you say? I said, give me the subscription. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jarrell, you are disqualified. disqualified. I want you guys in the chat right now to let me know who deserves this subscription. And I already see some coming in. And, and here's how it's going to work. We're just, we're just going to make this choice. We're going to look at the chat. Y'all let us know who deserves this, this subscription. And y'all tell us right now. It's a it's an annual subscription. It is international. But let me know who's been in the chat going crazy. And if you put yourself, Mr. Lordship, Mr. His Lordship, uh, <laughs> that, that vote is not going to count. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you right now. You cannot vote for yourself. This is how the creative fam works. We are a family. And so we help each other out. And so right now, you guys do me a favor. Vote for who you think has been providing the most value. I know I could have told you all this at the beginning, but here's the secret. This is how we do giveaways here on live streams. And Mr. Camera Junkie, I see he's winning right now. But um, he's been around for a while, so he maybe knew this. But he didn't know that this is how we were going to be doing the giveaway. In fact, I didn't tell anybody we were doing the giveaway. But what I want you guys to know is that every time we do a live stream, if there is a giveaway, this is typically how we do it. We like to make sure that you guys are providing value to each other. Because the truth is, like... We are a fam. You guys have actually given me feedback and that has made me a better creator on the platform. Um, you know, whether people giving me comments on my videos about my lighting <laughs> or my audio, uh, even on our first on our first live stream that we did last week, we were asking you guys about how it sounded and all of that just sort of dictated how we actually like made this live stream better. And so please let us know in the chat, in the comments, other ways that we can, you know, continue to actually make this live stream better. Um, but Hey, Brandon, we all, this is, this has only been our second live stream recently. And so we're getting better at this, but I just want to take a moment to say, I'm sitting here at the computer. I see every comment and we're going to get better at responding to everybody and do all those sort of things. But we want to let you guys know like your comments, they encourage us so much. We see your questions. We wish we could answer every question. Whenever you guys, when you're active in the chat and you're helping other people, like, man, it just encourages us so much because this is a family. And so we just want to encourage you guys, like even if next week we do or we don't do a giveaway, whatever that looks like, we want to make sure that like whatever we know, we, we're an open book. We want to give it to you. We want to help you. But here's the awesome part. There are incredible filmmakers in this chat and content creators. If you know something, say something you like and, and help each other out. And that's what that's what family does. Absolutely. All right. It's official. It's time to announce the winner. I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anybody, especially if you're looking in the chat. Our lucky winner is going to be Mr. Camera Junkie himself. And just to show you guys, I, I didn't pick this. You guys picked this. And and this is actually his second win, like, this month. Like, I think he won the light. 
Uh, I think it was the light. I'm pretty sure it was the light. Yeah. But yeah, he won the light. He's got multiple votes inside the live stream. I'm looking at it right now. Um, just really, really excited and happy to do these type of giveaways. So, Mr. Camera Junkie, you got it. He says he's blushing right now. Uh, um, I'm, I'm really, really excited that you won this. You did provide tons of value in the chat. And so congratulations, not just from me, but from other members of the Creative Fam Academy. I think we're both clicking on chats at the same time, Darrell. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, huge, huge uh, shout out to him. Congratulations. Really, really excited. Thank you guys so much for tuning in for this live stream. We're going to be back next week. So be sure to set your calendars. Also, check out the community tab over on my Instagram or over on YouTube, sorry, and also check out on Instagram. We're going to be playing around with some different times. We need to know what's the best time for us to go live. Are Fridays good? Should we pick other days? These are all the things we want to know. But ultimately, thank you guys so much for tuning in live with us today. We hope this has been incredibly value to, valuable to you. Mr. Camera Junkie, I'll be reaching out to you personally about your membership for Musicbed. And to everyone else who happens to be watching this on the playback, thank you guys for watching as well. And we'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Let's do it.